hospital uh, working there and before that I was working with Professor Alan Trivier in Charles Nicole Hospital in France. Uh, this is the 15th of April and uh, we had a talk in the API, Association of Physicians of India conference uh, in Jaipur. It was a very nice conference we organized. So my topic was post bypass angioplasty and this is a topic uh, very important because uh, we see not many patients who have undergone bypass surgery uh, quite years, many years back and they come back with unstable angina or unstable angina or acute coronary syndrome and these patients are actually now requiring more and more intervention procedure. As of now we know that saphenous vein graft which is one of the important armamentorium in the surgery. When the bypass surgery is done, for, there is a lima graft which is left into the memory artery which is mostly uh, given to or attached to the left empty descending artery and because of to cover the other blockages either you should do total arterial grafting which is right in the memory artery but most of the surgeons in India and outside India they are doing only uh, one lima and uh, one or two or three saphenous vein graft depending upon the blockages. Saphenous vein are taken out from the legs of the same patient and then with the reverse grafting done from the aorta to the location just distant to the stenosis either in obtuse marginal or posterior descending artery or in the diagonal branch. These are the grafts which are more vulnerable to blockages, re-blockages, re-operation. Why this happens? Because saphenous vein graft have a shelf, I would say shelf life because it's finally inside the body. A life which is, uh, the data has shown that at 10 years of follow-up, more than 50% of saphenous vein graft cut off. Uh, more than 50% of the saphenous vein graft get occluded. And if you see five years, more than around 30% of the saphenous vein graft will get thrombosed or degenerated and that's why the hampering the flow to the artery and that leads to uh, unstable or or a chronic stable angina or any kind of uh, acute coronary syndrome or sometimes acute myocardial infarction. So these patients, they, when they come to the interventional cardiologist, we do check angiography and then we find out the blockages, where the, where the blockages are there and uh, depending upon the blockages, we would like to do angioplasty of that lesion. Now, when we do angiography of post-bypass patient, we check the left ventral memory artery. We of course see the native arteries, left main artery and the right coronary artery. And after that, uh, we will do a left ventral internal memory artery by hooking to the subclavian artery. And then we will see the graft and out of two or three grafts, most of them, they get either occluded at a 10-year follow-up or they are not visualized. Mostly they are blocked at the, at the, steno, at the ostium itself. So it becomes a challenge for the interventional cardiologist to find out which artery to be revascularized. If we find that one of the saphenous vein graft is occluded at the ostium and there is no flow coming through that, then we would like to approach the native artery. And native artery angioplasty, uh, if it is chronic total occlusion, for example, right coronary artery, or it could be 99% occlusion or 80% stenosis, that is very simple to put a stent in the native artery rather than approaching the saphenous vein graft. But many times it happens that because of it, during the acute coronary syndrome, the patient's graft get diseased because of degeneration. And then of course the angioplasty of the saphenous vein graft becomes preferable as compared to the native artery because the native artery may not be amenable to angioplasty. So these are the graft and the angioplasty of graft was the main topic of today's lecture. So graft angioplasty is more challenging as compared to the native coronary artery angioplasty. Why? Because of three reasons. First of all, stent resistance is a little higher in graft angioplasty. We are talking of separate vein graft. Secondly, there is a high chances of no reflow phenomena or slow flow phenomena after putting, doing an angioplasty or putting the stent because the embolic, the material which is degenerative material that embolizes into the distal circulation and that hampers the result and therefore you don't get result too good as compared to this. And third is of course the long term efficacy of patency of the graft which I was covering how to have a long term patency of saphenous vein graft medically. So coming to the first point that is restenosis which is higher. If we see the graft angioplasty restenosis versus native artery angioplasty restenosis, restenosis is higher in graft angioplasty despite having a higher bore. And that is the data which has shown that is about 10 to 15 to 20 percent restenosis. So what to do about that? Of course, when it was initially planned, it was bare material stent, 
was being used and now drug looting stent is the actually being used for so many purpose. So graft angioplasty always drug looting stent. GP2B3 and receptor antagonist may not have good role because data have shown. Although I would be personally using GP2B3 and receptor antagonist in all the patients who have been graft. Coming on to the main important problem which is a no reflow or slow flow phenomena. So we have a distal protection, we have protection devices that will protect the embolic material or degenerative material to distally uh, embolize and that can be two types. One is distal protection that means you put a protection device distal to the lesion. Another is proximal protection, we, you put a device inside the graft before the procedure in the proximal to the, to the blockage. So distal protection devices are two types, one is filter wire, another is balloon occlusion. Balloon occlusion is more commercial but it is easier to do it because you have to, at the time, during time procedure, you cannot see what is going on, where you put, put it. You have to do a manipulation and then of course, if you are good interventional cardiologist, you can do it. Filter wire is more commonly used, where you put the filter wire beyond the uh, lesion, but after crossing the balloon wire, uh, the PTC wire, and then you do balloon dilatation, and then you put a stent. And then whatever amount of embolization, you capture it out and you remove it. And that gives a very good result and this is commonly used. And there have been so many randomized trials, protection versus no protection. It has shown that the protection is much easier and better to do it. Coming on to the proxis device, which is a proximal occlusion, that becomes, that is a very good thing because you put a device before putting a wire. So even the embolization will not happen while you're crossing the lesion with the wire. And that is most important thing to do. But it is a little more learning curve. So many of the interventional cardiologists are not using proximal devices. They are using only filter wire devices which is distal to the protection and gives a reasonably good result. The trial which has compared the proximal device and the distal device have shown a little more efficacy of proximal devices versus distal devices. Coming on to how to keep the graft pitted long term. So there have been two, three trials just shown that efficacy of statins. I would recommend all bypass surgeons, all physicians, all interventional cardiologists who are following up their patients post bypass that statins should never be discontinued despite having a normal cholesterol levels. There was a trial which has shown that 40 mg of Simba statin, long old when Simba statin came, now we have Utorva statin and Rosuva statin, that 40 mg of Simba statin given for 3 years, the follow up, the degeneration, the graft worked much better as compared to the, those patients who did not have. Uh, statins. So statins have a very good role, it should always be used. Secondly, the role of antiplatelets. It has been seen that if we give clopidogrel along with aspirin, the results and potency of sufferance being graft is more and therefore it should be given unless there is a major contraindication for dual antiplatelet. If the patient is more elderly, about 80 years old, but any patient who is beyond 55, 60, 60, 75, without any major bleeding history, without any interacting hemorrhage, without any cerebral vascular accident, without any bleeding ulcers in the gut, they should continue to have dual antiplatelet as we do in the angioplasty stenting. So this is summary, just to summarize again, sufferage vein graft is challenging. Three important problems, restenosis, distal no reflow phenomena, and of course how to keep it better. The protection devices have a major role. It should be used when there is a degeneration. Young graft, just recently blocked, you will not still require a digital protection or an approximate protection devices. But when in large thrombus, you can see a degenerative material. It's not thrombus. Degenerative material plus thrombus as a sluggish flow, you feel that this is going to embolize. It's better to use a protection device before doing angioplasty. I'm Dr. Professor Vivek Gupta. I was talking about cephalous vein graft angioplasty or post bypass angioplasty. One more thing. Very important, if you can see a native artery which is supplying an occluded sufferous vein graft and if you can do angioplasty of the native artery, it is always preferable to do a native artery angioplasty with stenting rather than going for a sufferous vein graft angioplasty. Thank you very much.